This is Floss Weekly. I'm Doc Searles. Simon Phipps joins me today and we talk about purism, which makes high quality computers and software with a focus on privacy, security and freedom coming up next. Floss Weekly is brought to you from LastPass Studios. Stay in control when it comes to your company's access points and authentication. LastPass makes security simple for your remote workforce. Check out lastpass.com slash twit to learn more. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is Floss Weekly, episode 581, recorded Thursday, June 4th, 2020. Purism. This episode of Floss Weekly is brought to you by Hover. Do you have a domain name that truly represents you and your passion? Visit hover.com slash twit to get 10% off your first purchase of any domain extension for the entire first year. And by Cashfly. Give your users the seamless online experience they want. Power your site or app with Cashfly CDN and be 30% faster than the competition. Learn more at twit. Dot cashfly.com. Welcome, everybody, to Floss Weekly. I'm Doc Searles. Uh, our guest this week is uh, Kyle Rankin of, of Purism. And our co-host is Simon Phipps, who we should see any second. Um, Simon, Hi. there he is with, with a microphone that's as big as a cantaloupe in front of him. <laughs> John says that it gives him a better audio. So, you know, I've, I've, it, it I've does. plugged it in. We, we, te- yeah. we tested this earlier. So so where are you? I can guess, but you, you better tell us. I am I'm in my lair in Southampton in the United <laughs> Kingdom. Uh, and the weather here today has been wet, back to form from, it's been cali- positively Californian here for at least the last month. Uh, but we're now back to a normal British summer, which is kind of chilly and wet. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and yeah, and here it's it, it it actually looks like Southampton a little bit, uh, but it's but it's actually just kind of blow, blowing blowing mist outside. I'm in Santa Barbara, so um, uh, so so our, uh, you know Kyle is going to be here from uh, from Purism, and and are do you fam- are you familiar with Purism? And uh, I am I, actually. I I, I I wrote about them a little bit for Infoworld at one point, uh-huh. and uh, went just when the when the company was getting going right at the beginning, and I've kind of tracked what they're doing ever since then, and I, I'm very interested in their approach to uh, creating a computer that doesn't have to become a hobby and yet does respect your freedom. Um, I, mm. I would buy one of those. Uh, I'm, whether I'm rich enough to afford one is another question. <laughs> that's, but, a, that's a big uh, thing. Those valuable things do tend to cost something, don't they? They do it's cost just, quite a lot a, of money. I found it's just not. It's just not fair. <laughs> okay. So I've got. Well, a, I have a passing familiarity, not as close as your familiarity with with Carla. I believe you work with him at Linux Journal. Yes, we worked for, together for a long time at Linux Journal, um, and uh, I think. Next to maybe myself and Carly, he was there longer than anybody. And uh, uh, to the uh, last bitter end <laughs> last summer, but it was, and the three of us all saw each other, uh, hung out together. We were all on stage at something called Freenode in Bristol yep. uh, about a year and a half ago, which is a Bristol, really fun conference. And I'd, I'd actually like to pick up on in the in our in the show on some of the stuff we talked about there, um, you two guys especially. But first, we must support the show and. Uh, and I'm really enthused about our sponsor this time because uh, we didn't even know earlier this week who the sponsor would be. At least I didn't know. Um, and uh, but it's Hover. All my domain names are are at Hover, and there are many that I bought there, and there are many that I moved there with their excellent assistance. I mean, really incredible handholding. This is a vulnerable time for us, and we need each other more than ever. Stay in touch by maintaining a domain name that represents you. Hover has over 400 of uh, name extensions you can choose from when you're building your brand or yourself or anything online. No matter what you want to build, there is now a domain name for it. And Hover is a jumping off point for many entrepreneurs and and uh, uh, people who want to start a business with a domain name that truly showcases who they are. And by the way, their customer service is obsessively good. I'm just, I'm always amazed. And you know, you get those little 
things afterwards saying, how'd you do? And I always click off 10 because it's always right up there. Free who is privacy protection, a clean and easy way to navigate UX and UI, monthly sales on popular top level domains. And it's not hard to see why Hover is a popular choice for people starting all kinds of businesses. Keeping your domain name separate from hosting gives you the flexibility to choose the right platform for your business. And by the way, they helped us with hosting too, because they don't do it. <laughs> you know, they're the ones that tell you, here's where you should go for, uh, for getting the, the hosting you want and moving off the one that you had. So use a domain name that truly represents you and your passion. Visit hover.com slash twit to get a 10% off on your first purchase of any domain extension for the entire first year. That's hover dot com slash twit for 10 percent off your domain extension for a full year and again we thank hover uh, enthusiastically for their support i'm really glad that uh that they are sponsoring us so let me welcome uh kyle rankin uh from purism and many other things kyle is uh uh, and, and not only the security officer, chief security officer and vice president at Purism, he's the author of Linux Hardening and Hostile Networks, DevOps Troubleshooting, the official Ubuntu server book, Nopix Hacks, and other books. I've written one and a, one and a third books, and he's written this whole pile of them. Uh, and he was, again, a columnist with, for us at Linux Journal for a very long time. So welcome, Kyle. This is really great to have you here. Oh, thank you. It's my pleasure. Thanks for having me on. So, so, so where are you in the physical world? We always have to check in on these things. Oh, sure. Yeah. So I'm here in Northern California, just north of San Francisco in my home office. So uh, even before the lockdown, uh, Purism is a fully distributed remote company. So uh, this has been my office for a number of years now since I've worked there. And even before when I worked at a couple of other uh, gigs where I was able to to get a couple of remote days. Uh, so, yeah, I'm here in my home office uh, with a, a bookshelf and a pinball machine. So so before we go into like issues and things, tell us a bit. I think I probably I am hope anyway that a lot of our uh, viewers today and listeners uh, on, on the podcast are familiar with Purism. But but give us the rundown on what it's about. It, it has a huge reputation and it's deserved. But give us some particulars. Sure, yeah. So uh, Purism started when uh, Todd Weaver, who's the founder and CEO of Purism, uh, has he has two daughters, and he uh, realized at some point as they grow up, eventually he needs to, he will, they will want a phone. And he wasn't happy with any of the choices that were out there as far as protecting their privacy. And so he realized, well, wait, I'm in technology, I can do something about this. So he founded uh, the company Purism, uh, with that in mind, to, to have like a freedom respecting uh, phone that re runs free software um, and protects privacy and is secure. But he also realized that you can't necessarily just start a company from the ground up just to make a phone, that you have to establish and ask people to, to fund it. Uh, you need to start somewhere, um, you, you have to start somewhere else. And so he started with some laptops. And so he started with a, leap, a 15 inch and a 13 inch laptop uh, that same sort of thing. It had it, it's privacy respecting. It runs free software. There, all of the components are selected so that you can run them on free software drivers, which is important because the OS that runs Pure OS, which is based off of Debian, uh, only has uh, free software packages. So there's no proprietary drivers or anything. So for everything to work, including Wi-Fi and everything, uh, you have to be very selective on what hardware is in there. So uh, essentially, we start by uh, selling hardware. Uh, like laptops, and, and we have a phone that's coming out soon. We have batches of it that are coming out, but mass production is coming out soon. Um, and we also offer uh, services now uh, called Librem One, which is a, a set of cloud services like chat and email um, and social media and VPN. Okay, Kyle, so how, are, how is the phone doing? I mean, you started with the laptops. You've, you've added the phone. Um, are you, are you selling more while people are, are uh, imprisoned <laughs> in their homes <laughs> or anything like there's, that? There's definitely a lot of interest in it. Uh, there, there continues to be even – so it, hardware is hard, uh, and we it's been quite a process to develop uh, this phone just because we've had to do it from scratch. Uh, there, the yeah. current ecosystem out there is all um, – has it, – it's uh, – there's nothing we could do off the shelf. We essentially, we, we, we told everyone what we wanted to do 
to have a phone that could achieve uh, Free Software Foundation Respect Your Freedom certification. A, a lot of people just said, yeah, it's impossible. And so uh, instead, we essentially had to build everything from the ground up. And we're at the point now where we are at our last batch, um, we call Dogwood as the code name, before mass production. So this is the last chance to get you know, to test everything, get everything working perfectly, uh, make sure all of the hardware works so that we can then crank out tons of these phones um, and fulfill all the orders. So what's a, uh, th that's interesting. I thought they were already in the market. So they're, they're still on their way to market while you're working it out. Is that right? Did I hear that right? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. what we decided to do, um, we knew that, you know, as we knew that we, as part of the process, a lot of, uh, a lot of people, you know, most companies hide this part of the process from the public, but there's all multiple iterations through hardware. Uh, we realized some people in our community are very technical and they are fine with getting early batches of, of our phone so that they could get it early. So what we announced was that we would start as, as we have these early batches, we would also people in the community who wanted to be in on that early batch, understanding you know the what the hardware would be like, um, could say yes, please give me an early batch, or I want to wait until the mass produced batch. Um, so yeah, we've had we've had this is our we're about to um, complete our fourth batch in that process. We've done um, A, B, C, and now we're on the D batch, and then the E batch is the final uh, mass produced large batch um, that's going to everyone. Hmm. So, so to, to, to go a little deeper into how you're, um, starting from the, uh, from the ground up, I think there was a kind of popular understanding or maybe an understanding Google wanted us all to have, um, that was, yeah, there's this open source base that's Android and Android is just, uh, it's, it's a special Linux that you can use in phones and anybody can do this, but apparently it's, it's not so easy. So when you're going from the ground up, you're taking how much are you taking from Android? Anything or some of it or what? Uh, nothing, nothing, nothing. Uh, the wow. Yeah, yeah. The operating system is the exact same operating system as our laptops. In fact, mm. and to me, this is really important because, uh, as as you know, and a lot of people know, Android is very fragmented as an operating system. You know, there's all these different. Every vendor has their own flavor of it and they include you know different things that they want to want to include um, and even in there are other Linux mobile OS's and even that's relatively fragmented because each one you have to take existing Linux applications and then port them to the platform and that's a problem because if you're a developer who wants an application to run on a lot of devices you have to decide well I not only want it to run on a Linux laptop if I wanted to run on this particular phone, I also have to figure out a way to port it to the phone. In our case, you don't need to do that. We're running the same pure OS operating system that our laptop runs. The only difference is it's running on a small form factor. So the challenge that presents is uh, phone screens are small and most uh, Linux applications are designed for, they assume at least a, you know, a 1024 by 768 screen or larger. And so when you try to shrink them down to that, to a small screen size, Many of them, the widgets, you know, run past the screen and things like that. So what we've done is we've developed a library called LibHandy. And what LibHandy does is it allows a developer writing a GTK application to, to describe what happens when you drag the corner of a application and make it phone sized. Uh, it, it, just like on a, a website nowadays, everyone is, is developing web, web applications and websites to be adaptive so that if this, if you're mm. looking at it on a tablet or a phone, Everything does the right thing, so it's usable on that screen. Um, and the same thing goes for um, web, for our desktop application. So it's the same exact applications on our phone that you would have on any Linux desktop. And ideally, um, the ones that work well, they all, I, I like to say, basically every Linux application runs on the Librem 5 already. The question is whether it fits on the screen. Right. So the question I've got in all that, Carl, is, you know, I watched um, Canonical do a, a quite similar sounding strategy to that with the Ubuntu phone. And the thing that uh, prevented them from succeeding, I believe, was the challenge of having an app store with apps that users actually wanted to run. Um, have you got that fixed as well? Yes, our plan with that is, uh, so we're starting with the sort of the foundational applications that we are we are working on that we think everyone needs to use the phone, you know, calling applications, ca uh, contacts, things like that. 
Um, in addition to that, there's we we are offering an app store, the Pure OS store. Uh, the idea behind that is to curate the existing app. You could install any Debian application and run it on the phone today. Uh, that's packaged for Debian and packaged for Pure OS if you wanted to. Uh, but to to run well on the phone, what we are coming up with is the Pure OS store, which is an application store where we just curate. Um, applications, um, ideally, we're aiming for them to be written in Flatpak, uh, so that way they have extra sandboxing using this library called Bubble Wrap that allows you to get similar sandboxing to what you would have on an Android application. Uh, that way also, uh, by by having it be in Flatpak, uh, it makes it easier for application developers to take existing Flatpak applications, existing Linux applications with the latest libraries and not really be concerned about what libraries are on the system level of, of pure OS today. Right. So that all sounds very, um, very, very geeky. That's a you know, very Linux community. And I, and I know that you, like many of us, has been, have been a part of the, the free software and open source community for a really long time. Do you think that that is compelling to uh, companies who need to get a return on investment? And do you think that's compelling to people who aren't Linux community members? Yes, for different reasons, though. So uh, Purism has always appealed to three different markets, and the Venn diagram has a center that has that some people fall in all three. But it's always been uh, freedom, security, and privacy have been sort of the three pillars. And we have customers that that prioritize one of those typically. And so with the phone right now, uh, the, the most interest – uh, is our foundational uh, free software community. And that's, that was true for the laptops as well when we first got going. Then when people started seeing uh, some of the security benefits, like the fact that our laptops have these hardware kill switches that allow you to uh, disable, sever the circuit for the webcam and microphone or the, or the um, Wi-Fi, uh, and the fact that the phone has the same thing, we'll start bringing uh, other people who are interested in that aspect of it or interested in the fact that we have a lot of interest from people who like the fact that the even the cellular modem is removable. Uh, some people want, in effect, almost like a tablet, uh, like a phone without a, a cellular modem in it uh, for privacy reasons or for security reasons. Um, so we have interest there too. But you're right that applications have to be convenient to be compelling, not just because they're free software. Uh, so for someone who isn't familiar with free software, you have to just show that one, the applications that we have are easy to use, and that's part of why we have it. We want a curated Pure OS store, so that we don't have a user clicking on it and installing an application that just doesn't work well on the screen. Um, so we can point them toward convenient applications. And then the second thing is that we have a, a lot of people that realize how personal their personal phone is. Uh, it contains you know, arguably more personal information than your personal computer, and you typically have it with you all the time. And so a lot of people that are interested in this are interested uh, because we've, besides the fact that we even in our articles of incorporation are focused on privacy, uh, the fact that everything is free software and you can audit and see whether or not applications are spying on you, which is a huge problem um, in the Android ecosystem, for instance, where uh, there's a lot of free, quote unquote, free as in free beer applications out there, but a lot of them are funded by your data. And so we have we have quite a few people who are interested in the phone because they're cons they have those concerns. Right. So do you think there's that that is going to lead to uh, app vendors investing in apps for your platform? You know, is is do, if, to, just to even get back to the basics, in your app store strategy, is there a way to uh, to monetize an app in the app store, or is everything uh, gratis all the time? So to Get into our app store, there is, you do have to have free software. So if you have a way of monetizing your software while also releasing it under a free software license, uh, then that's one method. We've also discussed ways for people to, um, via donations or things like that, uh, be able to monetize an application that way. Uh, but most of the models out there for for selling software end up um, being proprietary in one way or the other, either either they're free because they sell the data or they um, they don't release the source code. So we will have a hard requirement, at least in the App Store. Now, again, this is a Linux phone running actual Linux, just like a, a, a desktop computer or, or a laptop. So there's nothing preventing 
someone from um, running regular Skype, for instance, on the Librem 5 and installing it through a third-party repository just like you would on a regular Linux desktop. Uh, we don't – we – we uh, our policy is to treat the computer as something that the user owns, not us. So we, while we want to promote free software and our store will um, showcase only free software, there's nothing stopping a user from installing software from any source they would want. So before we go any further, um, uh, a word from our second sponsor, Cashfly. Um, and Cashfly is a CDN uh, that has been innovating in the content delivery business since 1999, which is in the last millennium. And they are now bringing you 100% cash shield. With this feature, you will benefit from a drastic reduction in data transfer rates with AWS's S3 and other cloud storage origins, increasing your cash hit ratio to 100%. We're at a point in time now where Consumers, ordinary people are expecting 4K content instantly delivered at any time on any device anywhere in the world. And that's a strain on, on, on the downstream side. So it's time to step up, whether you're uh, web page loading, your buffer, your video buffering or your games are downloading. You just need to be faster. And you can't do that when your cached items are being evicted in preference to large one off requests costing you a fortune in data transfer out fees. With 100% Cash Shield and Cashfly's guaranteed availability, there's now a simple way to avoid this. Uh, it's a next generation uh, content delivery solution for today and tomorrow, and it's a dedicated storage space just for you. So to go down a, a list of just some of the things it does, keeps your data and your content closer to your customers without the traffic of other companies. You can purchase as much space as you want and your data is fetched from 100% cash shield rather than from your separate origin. Shielding reduces your origin speed by thousands per month, guaranteeing no cash misses. It will also remarkably improve your download speeds with no buffering, and they give you guaranteed availability with the highest quality of service. You can easily and reliably scale your video streaming to reach global audiences of any size. Get hyper-fast download speeds, low latency, and a scalable solution for gaming. Your podcast as well will be delivered quickly and reliably without delays or timeouts. So receive lightning-fast digital download speeds for large digital files no matter where your customers are. Cashfly's global throughput performance dominance ensures that any cash misses are delivered five times faster than from your own origins. So just for Twit listeners... Cashfly is giving away a complimentary detailed analysis of your current CDN bill and your usage trends. You can see if you're overpaying 20% or more for CDN. So learn more at twitch.cashfly.com. That's twit.cashfly.com. And we thank them enormously for their support of our cast here. So a question I had is I can imagine – some interesting verticals um, uh, for especially for for companies that don't want to pay an either they don't want to pay an Apple or Google tax as it were for for uh, for the kinds of phones that that do what those do but but also in government and anything having to do with security and you're a security guy I would imagine it's the most secure phone you can get is that is that a, a fair statement um the hardware is definitely it's it, it's the platform allows for a lot more control over your security than you would get with say Android or Apple. I don't necessarily want to denigrate the security of Android or Apple just because they have very smart security teams who spend a lot of time working on the security of, the, of their platforms. I mean, Apple in particular has some top-notch security uh, protocols in place. However their approach is completely different. So uh, their approach is like a lot of security professionals where the goal is to cr to secure something for you by creating a lock that only they can open um, mm -hmm. and that you also can't open. You know, So they want you to delegate trust 100% to them uh, for your security. And many people are fine with that, uh, but that's not our approach. When Because we also, we don't just value security, we also value user freedom. When we develop security solutions, uh, we develop them without sort of looking down on the user or thinking of them as someone we have to 
protect almost like a parent child relationship, but mm. more, uh, we try to build a solution that gives them the control over their own security. So that's, that's for example, why we have the hardware kill switches. So if you decide that you don't want to have your cellular modem on, you can flip it off or you've, you don't want to be tracked at all. Uh, you can flip all three off and it cuts the power to every sensor on the device. But that's completely in your hands. You're not depending on the on trusting our operating system or trusting that the software in our operating system will do the right thing uh, when you tell it to turn something off. Uh, we think that you should trust us, but we try to build things in such a way that you don't have to. So, so uh, is, it, is that is that a security app that you have, or is that something in what we might call system prefs or in at some uh, nope. general level there? I'm wondering how easily one can get to that. No, it's it's literally a physical switch on the side of the phone. Wow, uh, that's so awesome. It's like a light switch. There's on on the left side of the phone. Um, there are three switches, uh, and one one controls the cameras, the front front and back facing cameras, and the microphone. Uh, one controls the Wi-Fi and Bluetooth, and one controls the cellular modem. And you uh, decide which one. If you want one to be powered off, you flip the switch, and it it cuts it severs the circuit, turns off the device. Uh, so, and then we've added what, it, in addition to that, we know some of our customers have very strong, uh, security concerns and they're concerned about all the other sensors on the device, uh, such as the accelerometer, the GPS, uh, things like that, the light sensors, even, uh, there's been some studies that show how you can use the light sensors to get way more information than you think you would be able to get about a person. So to solve that problem, instead of having the side of the phone full of a, a million switches, which wouldn't be very usable, uh, we've had we've created what we call lockdown mode. And then when you, to trigger that, you flip all three switches down. And once you flip them, it disables all of the things that I already talked about, plus every other sensor on the device. Uh, so, you know, your average person may not ever need to to use lockdown mode, uh, which we recognize. Uh, but some for some people, there's no other option. There's no other phone that has that as an option. Uh, and so we wanted to at least give you the option to say, you know, I don't want my GPS to be on. I don't want any sort of tracking at all um, on this phone, but I still want to use the phone in some degree. I want to run an application. And you can do that. You flip all the switches. It goes into lockdown mode. And then essentially you, you have a handheld tablet that runs Linux applications. I can see a whole load of people all the way across the U.S. who wish they had that capability on their phone right now. Oh, oh, absolutely. Yeah. In, in, fa in fact, I, I wrote a post um, on our site just, just yesterday uh, after I heard news that the DEA was now authorized to use some of their surveillance technologies that they usually use for drug enforcement um, for the protests. And one in particular that they have access to is what's called Dirtbag, which is a Stingray device which allows you to see all of the cell phones that um, are in a particular area. Only instead of it being within the proximity of a van that's driving around uh, a couple city blocks, it's aerial. So it's in an air so you can fly an airplane over an area, and and have all of the cell phones in that area connect to you and see who's there. Um, and so I, I wrote a quick post about you know if if you had a device like the Librem Five with a kill switch on the cellular modem, you could walk down the street. Say you're say you're not even involved in the protest, but you happen to be walking home um, in the in the area you could flip off the cellular modem and still even use the Bluetooth headset to listen to music on the way home or use the applications on the phone uh, without worrying about uh, being tracked. Now, those applications, um, as, a, as an application programmer, I'm kind of worried about the idea that the uh, system device I'm using might suddenly power off in the middle of what's going on. Uh, I can imagine a lot of programmers would not have allowed for that circumstance happening. Uh, doesn't it screw everything up to suddenly have the cellular modem or the the uh, the, the the Bluetooth radio or the the sensors suddenly vanish from the system? Uh, sometime in the past, it did. You know, a number of years ago. But because so many devices are USB based, uh, there's really good uh, now. There's so there's really good support in Linux for hot plugging devices. And so, for instance, uh, often cameras are USB are, are even if they're built into the laptop are USB cameras. And there is a lot of there's really good support in Linux for hot plugging those USB devices, and so uh, many applications handle it relatively seamlessly. If the device disappears, you you know if it's a, say it's the cameras, uh, we see this a lot with our kill switches. When you trigger the kill switch um, and shut off the camera, uh, it's as though you unplugged it from USB, and the the device that uses it says the camera's missing. And then when you when you flip the switch back on, 
the device reappears and the camera application detects it again and starts using it again. Um, right. I, I could see maybe there's an application that doesn't handle that well, but for the most part in our experience, especially with the cellular modem, it's just, you're talking about the networking disappearing. Um, and so right. most applications uh, handle relatively gracefully having the network either be slow or disappear for a moment. Right, right. So uh, we've been we've talked about your phone quite a lot here, and, and it is fascinating that you're you know you're you're once again trying to get a uh, a Linux based phone that respects your privacy uh, onto the market, and good luck with that. Um, uh, you sell laptops as well, and uh, I'm interested in the things you've done to respect people's uh, control over their own. Uh, operating system hardware on there. I, I, it starts at the boot level, I believe. You've got this this um, boot software. Uh, could you tell us about the steps you've taken to make the that Librem hardware really good at keeping us safe? Sure, thanks. Yeah, so we started uh, with the laptops porting Core Boot, which is a uh, open source BIOS replacement uh, onto all of our laptops. And so our, all of our laptops right now come standard with Core Boot, but it also runs uh, this program called CBIOS, which uh, acts like a standard um, BIOS on a computer that lets you boot into an OS. But we have been doing work on um, adding, replacing that with a project called Heads, and that combined with a lot of other software we put in the boot process, we've called we um, have titled Pure Boot. And what it essentially is is a, is a replacement for. Um, a lot of the secure boot software that you might find out there for a regular laptop, um, but it it protects your boot process um, in a way that where you hold all of the keys. So just to back up, try to explain it quickly. Uh, traditionally, on a secure boot laptop that you would buy today, uh, it protects the boot process by having signatures um, of uh, and only allowing certain uh, software to boot on the laptop if it's been signed by Microsoft and there are there's certificates and things in the laptop to enforce this. Uh, we felt like that takes away the user's uh, ability to, to control their laptop if they have to get permission from a third party, even if it's not us or even if it were us, to boot software on the, on the machine. So instead, uh, Pure Boot uh, allows you to uh, make sure that this firmware hasn't been tampered with, uh, but in a way that it's using free software it's also using keys that are 100% under your control. You can change out all of the keys at any time uh, with your own keys. So typically the way that this works is from the factory, you will get the laptop and then you will get um, something called a Librem key, which is like a USB security dongle that you might uh, see, you might use for storing GPG keys or if you've done any sort of thing where you've stored a GPG key or authenticated with a site using a USB key, um, it's similar to that. When you get the laptop, you can plug in the Librem key and turn on the laptop and then look at the, there's an LED um, on, on that Librem key that if all the firmware matches what it, what it was set to at the factory, that light uh, blinks green. Um, if anything is different, it blinks red. And so visually you can easily check whether your laptop's been tampered with. And once you um, see that it's green, you trust the entire boot firmware from that point on. And within that, then once you trust the boot firmware, you can use that trust to extend and, and test the rest of the system. Um, everything from uh, testing uh, the uh, slash boot directory for all of the for the kernel and all the important boot files to make sure that they um, haven't been tampered with, but you're doing it with your own signatures. Right. So this, uh, to what degree is Pure OS dependent on these um, these physical or these firmware factors? You know, could I take Pure OS and, and throw it on a, a, an old laptop or an old tablet, or do are the two things really um, married to each other? Uh, you, so you can you can definitely you can boot uh, a laptop that can run Pure Boot. Uh, you can, for the most part, we're one of the few uh, companies that are shipping laptops that is running this particular uh, uh, boot security program. It's the, underneath it, the, the software is called Heads. Um, there are some um, refurbished ThinkPads that sell it, um, and but we're the only um, vendor that I know of that has a new new hardware um, that's not refurbished that's running uh, Pure Boot. Uh, as far as Pure OS goes, you can run Pure OS um, on. Any laptop that runs that would run a, a traditional Debian distribution, the challenge with Pure OS is that because it only runs free software, 
Um, it's been certified by the Free Software Foundation to only have free software. Uh, it doesn't have any proprietary drivers in it. So if your old laptop uh, requires, uh, say, a binary blob to initialize the Wi-Fi card, that's a really common case, uh, you would need to go either to Debian or to um, some other some other third party and get that binary blob and load it to, uh, to get that driver working for your laptop. Right, right. So, uh, you know, I, I can see that really you're very passionate about keeping the, the system safe. Um, do you think that the number of people in the uh, free and open source software community who share your passion is growing or shrinking at the moment? I think it's growing, and, and more importantly, I think it's bringing in people from outside the free software community who um, are interested in security first. So, of that three, uh, that three-legged, those three columns of freedom, security, and privacy, there's a strong segment of our customer base that's focused, who prioritizes the security part of that, uh, and they are they are starting to recognize the value of the freedom side as well. And so, a lot of these features, like our kill switches or like Pure Boot, are attractive to those people um, in addition to some of the free, soft, free software crowd. But yes, I'm definitely seeing a lot of people recognize that how important it is to have full control over the system and the security of the system. And so software like PureBoot or, or PureOS itself, uh, people are realizing that if they want to be able to trust the software that's running on their computer, they need some way to audit it. Even if it's not, even if they don't have the ability to audit it themselves, being able to have someone else audit it for them or, or understand that the community could audit it uh, gives them more peace of mind. So I'm wondering, uh, I mean, everything has trade-offs and everything has costs. And the simplest question is what, 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 do, what are people looking to be paying for either the laptop or for the phone, uh, if you're comfortable talking about that? But also, oh, sure. you know, yeah. Well, yeah, so we're not... Uh, Purism doesn't uh, isn't in the the low cost laptop game. You know that's sort of a race to the bottom uh, with vendors that have huge scale. Um, and so instead, we're focusing on uh, the values that we add to the hardware that we have. So number one, we are we build our hardware um, that so that it only so that it can run with free software, and we also forward use. Uh, we forward all of the free software drivers and upstream support that we can to help promote that. Um, yeah, so our laptops, for example, the 13-inch laptop is $1399, and the 15-inch laptop is $1599, just so that the prices are easy to remember. Uh, but we're, we consider ourselves competing in a space more like a, a ThinkPad, like a, a higher-end ThinkPad, a MacBook, um, or something like that, or maybe maybe a higher-end Chromebook. Uh, that it, all, those also happen to run core boot. Uh, so that's sort of the area that we're looking in. We're not necessarily trying to compete in the super low cost laptop space because, you know, in addition to buying the hardware itself, you know, some people focus strictly on the specs, but you're also getting full support over the Linux desktop, the, the, uh, even the firmware, the free software form, firmware that we're running, um, all the way through the stack, uh, from the company. So, uh, how much uh, customization might be possible there? How much? Uh, I mean, somebody wants eight terabytes of uh, of uh, of storage or something like that. Can they can they get that? Is that a, a possibility? And I know when competing higher end uh, systems, this stuff is hardwired in. You can't really swap it out. But uh, is that is that possible? Is there much customization possible? Yeah, that's a that's really important to us. Uh, we are we try. There, there's a big trend in the industry. There's been this drive toward thinness, which, in my opinion, has ruined absolutely ruined laptops. Uh, the drive to be mm. thin, even if the footprint is gigantic, and you know, a thin laptop that has a gigantic footprint isn't necessarily more portable to me. Uh, but in that drive for thinness, we've gotten things like uh, batteries that aren't user serviceable. Um, Keyboards that are that are more challenging to type on, uh, RAM that's soldered in uh, to the laptop, and even sometimes disks that aren't replaceable. Or so in our case, we have regular Phillips head screws on the bottom of our case, and you can remove those screws yourself and get access and replace the RAM. Um, and our laptops right now have two different storage options. You can uh, we have a traditional SATA port where you can install a solid state drive. Um, we also have an M.2 slot. Where you can install, you know, NVMe 
really high speed. It looked like a little stick of RAM um, hard drives. That's cool. That's cool. I, 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 I've stabbed many old laptops with with uh, with screwdrivers. I, I'm also thinking too, but the, the the thinness is also I think so. You can break it over your knee if you want to. I mean, that's <laughs> I, I, I experience with thin laptops. In my own case in the past is is actually sitting on one and then have the thing fold. It's kind of it, it, it's kind of tough. Um, so um, I'm I'm wondering. If we could switch a, a tiny bit to where you and Simon and I actually kind of left off at the conference we were all at a year and a half ago, um, when one of the questions was how the community is changing, what what's, <clears throat> and you have a kind of an interesting uh, a vendor's angle on that and what people are buying, but uh, with uh, one of the complaints uh, by one of the other speakers, maybe it was by you too, I don't know, is that. Um, was that a lot of the, for example, Linux developers are working on Macs and, and PCs um, and they're working, you know, they're just they're, they're using tools that don't necessarily require a Linux box to operate and are kind of farther away <clears throat> from the sort of the moral foundations, you might say, of 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 floss, you know, of the, of the, the freedom side. I mean, it's, it's one thing to ha have that as a, a value for the company. But I'm wondering how much people are tuned into that on the customer side. Do they care more about that now? Do they care about it less? You know, they, you know, a problem for Linux in a way was that it won. <laughs> you know, it was, you know, 25 years, 20 years ago, even 25 years ago, it was an underdog, and now it's the overdog, and you don't worry as much about that stuff. So I'm wondering if, in your position, you have more thoughts about that. Yeah. So to me, what's happened is the Linux community has expanded, like you said, due to the just amazing success of it, but also tech itself has expanded the tech industry, you know, to be involved in the tech industry, you know, 20, 30, 40 years ago, you, you had to, tech was not very accessible. Fewer people had computers. It wasn't a given that you grew up with a computer in your house, much less internet, internet access or anything like that. Uh, to get involved in technology, you typically, you essentially had to be like me, you had to be a, a giant nerd uh, sitting, sitting alone in your, it, in your uh, house, you know, in a basement hacking on things. Uh, because there's all of this really esoteric knowledge you had to have to set up a computer, to use a computer, to program for a computer. Well, since, you know, fast forward 20, 30 years, and technology has been way more um, accessible. Uh, and everyone now uh, has access to technology. And most people um, in, in, you know, middle class and up at least, if not, uh, less than that, neighborhoods, you know, have access to a computer in some way, if not growing up in a household with a computer or if not having a computer in their pocket at all times. So it's very, way more uh, accessible and the way to develop those that technology and use that technology and contribute is also way more accessible. So what that's meant is the entire industry, not just the free software um, community, but the entire industry has become more diverse because there are way more, the, the barrier to entry to contribute to this industry is is different. You don't have to have spent you know decades in a basement looking at obscure C code to contribute. There's all these different avenues where you can contribute to technology with tools that are way easier to use and way more accessible. So this has caused the free software community to have to also have a huge number of people who have joined it who aren't who, who didn't join it because they were a giant nerd like myself who was really interested in free, in free software licenses. They may not even be familiar with free software licenses. It could just be that they work for a company, they got a job in technology where they happen to be developing free software for their company. Uh, and, or they may be developing software that isn't free, but they're developing it to run on a Linux server in, in, in the cloud somewhere. All of these people to me are all uh, members of the community but it's caused this culture clash between sort of the old guard who um, has certain standards for you must know X, Y, and Z esoteric knowledge to join, who also, like myself, are relatively socially awkward as a stereotype um, and weren't necessarily the popular kids in school. Well, now you have the popular kids in school are all um, working on, are all like starting technology companies and, and coding. Uh, so there's this huge culture clash between, I, I likened it to uh, someone, uh, some geeks uh, ha having everyone over to do a D&D &D campaign and uh, they're having a good time. 
And then all of the everyone else hears about this great party going over going on over there. They show up and see it's a D and D campaign. Like this party sucks, and they start throwing a kegger. Um, well, both sides of this community that are now coming together, all contributing to somewhat common causes, are coming at it from different angles. And I don't think uh, the community has yet quite figured out how to handle the culture clash. Um, both the the people who have oh. who have been here for decades. Yeah, sorry, go ahead. Oh no, no, I'm just saying. Wow, you carry on. That's that. This is really oh. interesting stuff. <laughs> yeah. So I I don't think the community's figured out how to handle this culture clash yet. You have. Uh, the old guard, sort of like people like myself, who um, who aren't sure how to, uh, who are learning new social rules that they didn't necessarily have to learn before, uh, because it's it was it's not second nature. Now the thing is, uh, that guard also makes a lot of excuses for not having to learn these new social rules, as though uh, geeks can't learn new protocols, or as though they haven't spent hours debating whether you should top post or bottom post in a mailing list, you know? So, so geeks can learn protocol and, and etiquette, no problem. Um, it's just a matter of will. Now on the flip side, you have a lot of people where social engagement comes naturally. Um, and a lot of these, these, uh, these rules of etiquette um, come naturally and it's, it's expected and understood that everyone behaves a certain way. Um, and so uh, on that side, there's, there isn't as much of an understanding of, of that there, I haven't seen, I, I would like to see, how about this? I would like to see um, an attempt on um, that side to allow people who are still learning a lot of these new shows, social rules where it didn't come second nature to them to make mistakes safely and then recover um, if they have obviously the right attitude and, the, and a willingness to learn what's essential to them a new protocol. So this is really interesting because um, I'm thinking about how Right now, at this point in time, with the quarantines going on and all, sports has been suspended. If you're looking in school environments, sports has been suspended. So all of the social um, stuff, including the social caste system that starts with the jocks at the top and all of that kind of stuff, and they're the popular ones, and you're in school, and <laughs> you're not even in school anymore. But And it seems to me that being quarantined at home is something that's very uh, kind of normal and kind of comes more easily to the to geeks that like to sit at keyboards and looking at their glowing rectangles and stabbing things with tools and um, and socializing around the kind of games you play in that in in those circumstances and I'm and I'm wondering if if not only do you have any thoughts on that but if you're observing anything about that from where you're standing especially if you look at it through this sort of social breakout you were just describing. Well, what I'm, I guess what I'm noticing is, you know, a lot of people who are more introverted or while everyone's having challenges with the times that we are in, people who are naturally more introverted are having, I think, an easier time coping and an easier time communicating. In some cases, it's much easier for, for a, a group of, of this community to communicate over a, a chat, a text chat, um, than it is to have to be in person and communicate. You know, and so a lot of those people are finding it a lot easier to cope. I mean, I personally, I've, like I said, I've been working from home for a number of years. And so as that part really wasn't all that working from home, uh, wasn't disruptive for me, um, due to, you know, all of these lockdowns going on, uh, what was probably the most disruptive was, you know, doing homeschooling at the same time. Um, uh, but that's a completely different thing, you know? So, yeah, I think that, um, sort of the, the old guard has already has a lot of is used to communicating one asynchronously because in the free software community, you're often working, collaborating on a project with people from all over the world uh, who are more importantly in all kinds of different time zones. So it's really important to have tools that allow you to collaborate in an asynchronous way. So you don't have to be right next to someone having a conversation in the kitchen uh, to be able to figure out a problem. You know, you have to be able to hand off work or uh, collaborate uh, either over email or other tools that allow you to do it while the other person's asleep. So I have a question based on all that, Carl. Um, does this social context make purism strong or weak? Um, does the fact that your company is uh, your start, you, you're brilliant people. You know, I, I, I was very impressed by Todd when I first spoke to him all those years ago. Uh, everything you're doing is is brilliant hardware and software. 
uh, you're catering for a community of people who are who are like us. Um, does this make you strong in a world that is evolving at the moment, or does it make you weak? So I would say that it makes us much stronger because we um, don't. We've never thought of ourselves as simply a company that sells laptops that run Linux. We're not a. We don't think of ourselves as a Linux laptop company. We deeply and believe strongly in free software ideals, but we think that everyone, not just geeks, deserve those freedoms. And so all of the software that we develop, all of the hardware that we develop is is made with that in mind. Um, you know, in the case of our laptops, we try as hard as we can to make it as convenient as, as possible for everyone, not just people who are familiar with Linux um, to use our laptops. And the same goes for the phone. It's just the phone happens to be from as far as the progression goes, um, you know, further behind as far as we have a groundswell of interest from the free software community first. Um, but we are continuing, like as we develop it, we're developing it with everyone in mind. So um, at least our focus is to cast a wide net because, like I said, we don't think that only free software nerds deserve freedom. Uh, we think it's good for everyone. So we we tend to wrap every show with uh, with uh, three questions, and and so I'm gonna I'm gonna hit you with the the first of those is Are there any questions we haven't asked that you would like it if we had asked, or that we should be uh, asking? No, honestly, I, I I think we covered everything that I would love to talk about. So yeah, I'm, I'm really glad we were able to talk about the community like we did, and we've covered a lot of the the things that I was excited about um, that I've been working on the last couple of years. This is great. Cool. The, the, the second one is just it, it can go in any direction you want. It's in some cases it's a joke, in some cases it's not. And that is anything about blockchain. So, the, so you have to say blockchain at some point. Oh, yeah, blockchain. Cha-ching, cha-ching. Um, where's, where's all that money raining down? Uh, so uh, hmm. it's interesting. In, in, in our community, we have a lot of people in our community who are all in on uh, blockchain technologies, on uh, cryptocurrencies, specifically um, because they have really high security requirements. Uh, when you're storing, you know, maybe a million dollars on your laptop, you really care about the security of that laptop. Uh, and so uh, a lot of our community is is deeply interested in, in blockchain technologies and specifically cryptocurrencies. I mean, we accept cryptocurrencies uh, as payment. Uh, in fact, a, a significant amount of our sales of our of our hardware comes through uh, Bitcoin. Uh, we that's one of the many options you have when you buy our laptops, and quite a few people pick that option, which has always been pretty interesting. The, the final one is that uh, when we ask everybody is what what are your favorite text editors and scripting languages? Oh yeah, so um, I've been a long time uh, VI and Vim user. Uh, I've written all of my books and all of my Linux journal articles were written in Vim. Uh, so many of the books, uh, you know, every publisher has their own layout software and their own formatting software. But all of the first drafts of everything I've written has always been in Vim, uh, no matter how lar large the book. It's just way faster and easier for me to get thoughts down in Vim. Um, so that's the first question. Um, as far as scripting languages, these days, a lot of my uh, scripting ends up being in, in uh, Bash. Uh, I was a huge Perl proponent, proponent for the longest time and, and, and still love it. It just, as it started falling out of use, and in particular, as I ended up working at one point at a Python shop, um, they weren't too keen on me contributing more code that was Perl. And so, um, I started becoming way more proficient at writing, uh, I guess, more complicated bash at that point uh, for things I needed to write that what didn't necessarily map well to Python. So I guess bash is the is the script. I mean, a lot of pure boot actually um, is written in bash. Fantastic. So I so thanks so much, Kyle. This has been really fantastic. I uh, you're uh, very, very lengthy and complete. And uh, and I hope for our our audience and in, informative informative answers. Uh, I, I'm, I'm very, very excited and enthused about what you're doing and what, and what purism is doing and where it's coming from. So, um, so, so I guess it's time for the plugs. I, I'm still getting, I'm still. A 
We could talk about the okay. guest. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And I also want to thank um, uh, Simon Phipps for being a co-host on the show. Um, and and he will actually be back uh, next week when we're talking about OSI, which is a topic uh, very close to very close to his past uh, and present. Um, we're going to have on Joshua Simmons of the Open Source Initiative, the new president of the Open Source Initiative, a, a, ti a title that Simon held for a long time. So uh, and is local for us to the degree that we have a location uh, in uh, in Petaluma, California. Um, so that's kind of a coincidence as well. So look forward to next mm. week. Josh has actually been in our studio audience, you know. Um, oh, really? He's, he Yeah, he, he lives close enough that he can come down and, and come into the studio and sit and um, watch the show being made. Fantastic. Fantastic. Well, we're, we're really excited to have him on. It was just a purely coincidental thing. He wrote to me about something else. And I said, wait a minute, wait a minute. Let's, uh, let's put these pieces together. <clears throat> Got a long, a long list of people that I've, I've, I've written to and we're bringing on for, uh, for shows coming up and bringing in other, other co-hosts as well. So is there anything you want to plug before we move on, uh, Simon, that you're working on? Um, you know, I'm, I'm very lightweight these days. Uh, most of what I used to plug was conference appearances and I don't do those anymore. Um, <laughs> Who does? So, yeah. uh, I, the, you know, I'd simply encourage everybody to, uh, to follow me on, um, uh, Twitter and everywhere else as a uh, web mink. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm very grateful to the people who have sponsored me on Patreon and to the one person who is uh, backing me on GitHub. I'd love some more GitHub sponsors. And uh, th th that backing that I get there is uh, extremely valuable for keeping me able to spend time from my day job uh, on doing community things. So thank you very much to the people who are sponsoring. Uh, and that's really all there is for plugs when you haven't been outside the compound for about nine weeks. <laughs> yeah yeah but um i my i have two small plugs one is uh for um the reality 2.0 podcast which i do sometimes with kyle who is just on and uh and Catherine Druckmann. so look that up our r2 cast and a letter r2 and cast um and uh and uh, the thing i'm working most on lately is customer commons is customercommons.org we have enormous um, ambitions for that. Had a great board meeting this morning. We're going to be doing some really interesting stuff there. So just watch that space. There's not a whole lot there yet, but it's very radical and it can do some good things. So, um, uh, yeah, I guess we <laughs> thanks so much, everybody. And we'll see you next week on Floss Weekly. Hey, folks, I am Micah Sargent, co-host of Tech News Weekly right here on the Twit Network. Yes, Tech News Weekly is a show we do every week, Jason Howell and myself, where we talk to people who are making and are breaking the tech news. That's right. It's journalists, it's inventors, it's app makers, it's everybody who's bringing the tech news in a given week. It's all the stuff you want to know about in bite-sized chunks in a fantastic package. So be sure to subscribe. It's twit.tv slash TNW.